Hello, I'm Ed Halsey and welcome to Grinding My Gears, the new show from Evermore Digital in which we invite market professionals to nominate their most low things about the insurance industry to be cast into the depths of hell forever. Our guest today for this extra spicy US special, joining us first from the furnace, it is risk transfer guru Nick Lamparelli. It is insurance activist and customer co-conspirator Seth Zaremba. He hails from where InsureTech loves insurance, Billy Van Dura. And my guest host today is a man with more nicknames than Chris Jericho. He is the patron saint of InsureTech, the most interesting man in insurance, the author of The End of Insurance as We Know It. It is Rob Galbraith. Okay, so we'll kick straight off with the show. Uh, so, Nick Lamparelli, what is grinding your gears about insurance? What is grinding my gears and has been grinding my gears for many years is insurance regulation. I get it. We need regulation. I understand. Good regulation protects consumers and creates a healthy market. So I'm going to break this up into two pieces, Ed. The, uh, my low-hanging fruit cast in hell so, uh, you know, the mango fruit of the world that you just want to toss <laughs> down into blazes is commercial insurance regulation. We don't need it. These are businesses. They're big people. They're adults. They do almost entirely all of their business through brokers, which are also big people. They, they can take care of themselves. They, they know what a good price is. They know how to shop for this. They know how to read a policy form. They know how to protect themselves. Why do we have to file rates and file forms for commercial insurance? These are big people. We don't have to do it. So that's the low hanging fruit. My audacious goal, uh, cast in hell is, uh, rate filing and form filing. It does not make it, I just don't see the benefit of it. I see these carriers, they file rates, and then I see these insure techs come in and they're charging a fraction of what the filed rate is. It doesn't make any sense. I thought we were trying to create a healthy insurance market. So they have flexibility to cut the price, but they have no flexibility to go above the rate. It doesn't make any sense. Why are we doing this? And the regulators are not regulating. If anyone is regulating the market, it's the rating agencies and the reinsurers. They're regulating the market. We are big people. We know how to take care of ourselves. There's, we have plenty of insure tax. We have plenty of technology companies. We have plenty of third-party resources that can tell consumers how to protect themselves. Those are my two goals. Can we just take regulation and do something positive with it for once? Amazing. I love that one. I think my, my only immediate comment on that is you, you've said that we're all big people. Let's bear in mind when COVID hit, um, we as big people had to be taught by governments how to wash our hands properly. That would be my only comment on that one is, <laughs> is just how big we are, lowest common denominator. Anyone else got any immediate thoughts on that one? I think it's a great one to put in. It's, it's very frustrating. Well, I, I think it's like become a boogeyman too. It's like, oh no, uh, look what will happen after dark. And the fear of regulation prevents the possibility of innovation. And so we've created this boogeyman that it's just like, well, we should do this. We should do this because it's happening. Every well, regulation, I'd, I'd love to do it, but you know, the boogeyman. And so I think in some ways it's become a wet blanket on creativity and innovation. Let's figure out how to be innovative and creative, and then we'll regulate it. But if we worry about regulation, we'll never get to creativity and innovation. So it's just a little backwards. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone else? So Not Nick, uh, I've got a question for you. What about getting rid of state-based regulation in the U.S. and going to one federal regulator? What say you? So uh, 50 or 50 plus two, 50 plus four regulators across the U.S., is a burden. You know, it's a burden for brokers that have to license themselves in 50 states. It's a burden for carriers that have to file rates and forms in 50 states. But I would say, Rob, uh, and Seth, you brought up the boogeyman. I would be, I think I would be much more wary of a federal uh, overseer because then it's going to be just a completely political football. So 
my answer would be a hard no. Let's fix the one that we have. Yeah, we saw that movie. That's why we left England, right, Ed? Like we had that, <laughs> that surf dump. And we're like, can we get a couple of boats going uh, west, please? Right. So yeah, I think we did the movie before. I think this. I think the sad thing is, as well, it's, it's regulation, compliance, all those kind of things. They were brought in to protect the customer, but actually, what it seems to have done is it just makes the whole experience way worse for the customer. It makes yes. it harder to buy it. It makes it less understandable in terms of policy wordings. It makes process way more cumbersome than it needs to be. So no, I think that's a, that's a great one. And what a start we're off to with that one. You've gone straight in on that, Nick. I'm very <laughs> impressed with this. This is just the tone we for want. You, Seth. <laughs> Excellent. Just the tone we want. And and on that note, Seth, we're going to move on to you. What's grinding your gears in the uh, insurance industry at the moment? Okay, I'm flaring my nostrils. Hold on. <laughs> okay. Um, any plan, any statement, or any strategy that starts with agents can't and agents won't. I mean, the news of our demise has been greatly exaggerated, and I, and I'll and I'll start I'll start at the surface and move all the way down to shield a common grave on this one. Um, InsureTax, please, I'm your distribution force. I can't tell you in the last two years how many InsureTax I've gone to and gone to the back office and said, "What are those forty people doing? Oh, they're writing policies." Oh, like I do, right? So, um, can we just admit that there's a distribution force? here with leather buckets for a couple hundred years doing the thing and that we we need to work together on that so that would be my first thing is just like those 40 people in the back are insurance agents and i don't care what your front end looks like you're running an insurance agency so let's all figure this out together um carriers agents won't or can't adopt technology won't or can't handle change won't or can't um create a new model or do something different or 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 distribute in a different way it's absolutely false i'm talking to agents all over the world and, and and that is just such a myth and the fact that we start sentences that way means we end completely wrong I mean, let's face it, if you start a trip the wrong way, you're never going to get where you want to go. If you're one degree off in your assumption over the course of a couple thousand miles, you miss a whole state. And so if we start with the assumption that agents can't or won't as carriers, we're going to miss the outcome by miles, by, by, by whole states, by whole countries. And so we have to get out of that mindset. And I would say, too, in thought leadership, too, there's so much thought leadership, great thought leadership that starts with the assumption that agents can't and agents won't. It's rubbish. I throw it all in the bin. It's all rubbish. When, 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 the, when the last bomb drops, when the smoke clears, there will be two things. Me selling insurance to cockroaches. <laughs> I love that. That is That could well be the quote of the episode, I think. <laughs> was, it, was it Audrey Hepburn who said as well that even the phrase, I can't, uh, includes I can? Yeah. It was Audrey Hepburn who said that. And it's a great, I think just the, the, the principle overall of can't and won't it is not, it's not a great method, be it in insurance or anything else. Anyone else got any views on that one? I think that's another great one. Seth, for what, four years ago, we were in Vegas at this big fancy conference. And, and here we are four years later. And I'm looking at some of these companies that I have sold more insurance than them in the last four years on a shoestring but man, they've done a heck of a job out fundraising me because they are sitting on huge bank accounts. But what are you going to do? <laughs> well, I would permanently amend going forward. What I would replace things with is it's not it, it's not an or it's an and. So it's not technology or insure tech or agents. It's insure tech and carriers and agents. And so the second the industry or the world hears the words of work, Grab your coat, grab your bags, and, and catch the nearest ride home because that conversation is going nowhere. It is always an and. It is never an or going forward. And, and, if, and if you just start the sentence right, okay, how do we do this with agents? Or how do we help them do these things? That is a winning formula. Will there be problems? Are there changes? Are there legacy things? Yeah. But you don't have to invent fire of the wheel either, which is that seems like a lot of things are struggling with. So with you there. I was having that chat with someone literally just before we came on this call, actually, about InsureTech in general and the importance of of actually it's all about writing premium. It's that the purpose of an InsureTech isn't there to, to raise money. It's there to write premium. 
Um, that's that's why we're all here is to sell insurance policies. And that has to be front and center of every single every single strategy that you have. That's the only thing you should be measured by. Um, so now I, I agree with that entirely. Anyone else? Yeah, I have a comment. Uh, Peter Thiel in Zero to One has a chapter on if you build it, will they come talking about distribution? And he said that uh, most, most people in business undervalue sales. Silicon Valley nerds under undervalue uh, it more than most. And uh, Seth, you're 100% correct. Uh, have a little humbleness, have some hubris. You can't just plaster a web page up and think that you're going to replace someone who can, uh, that's, that's going to church with your customer. It's not going to happen. And I've, I'm building an entire business around the agency brokerage. And to me, it's a value add because I am hiring a professional sales force. Compete with me. I dare you. That's another great quote. We're just quotables here. Compete with me. I dare you. I like that one as well. I think that needs to be your, uh, that needs to be your Twitter banner, I think, Nick. <laughs> I'll change <laughs> it like right that. after this. You do, do, please. Excellent. And we're going to move on to uh, Billy Van Jura. And Billy, what's the, what's the background you've got there? It looks like, is it a football stadium? Like a proper football? Like, oh, 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 it's <laughs> proper now. Uh, uh, according to uh, the folks in England, it's proper now. It's the newest one into the premiership. It's referred to as Ellen Road. Uh, oh, Leeds United. That is the Don Reedy stand you're looking at. Uh, in case nobody's familiar, I know they haven't made their rounds in the Premiership yet. So this is a ground. If you follow the Premier League, you'll see at some point in the next few months. <laughs> Nick's looking utterly awesome. baffled. What are, you, what are you talking about? What is Premier League? <laughs> <laughs> it's the one where we actually the, the foot actually touches the ball in the sport. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that, I've that heard is, of that. that one. I'm, I'm not going this route in a room. <laughs> this is not a fight to pick in a room with <laughs> four Americans. I'm absolutely, uh, I'm on my own on this one. Absolutely. But Billy, what's, what's your, what do you want to cast into the depths of hell forever about insurance? I think I know. Oh, insurance advertising has just, every day, it's, it's the same old thing. These really intelligent human beings with a lot of data, you have the actuaries, you have the underwriters, and you have this company sitting on a pile of cash, and I think the cash is on fire. And if they don't spend it on something, they feel like they're going to lose it. So they send me a piece of paper at least once a week in my mail. But if that piece of paper has writing on it that I need a magnifying glass to read, is that really advertising? Like if there is fine print, you're hiding something from me, forgetting that the rate is false, right? And these same companies that send out these advertisements make one offer to their non-customers and then a separate offer to their customers. So if you're going to make an offer to someone who's not loyal to you, who hasn't had their insurance with you for a decade, you should not be allowed to make that offer. How could you possibly be making an offer to a non-customer who can get a better rate than me, your loyal customer who pays his bills and has no claims and everything is fine? It's just preposterous that that's allowed. I think Billy's being sneaky here. I think he's, he's, he's managed to sneak two in. He's got insurance advertising and then he's just covertly, stealthily just snuck dual pricing in there as a uh, major part of the argument. I, I, I mean, that's, that's a tour de force. Of, uh, but, but the dual pricing, it, it's, the, it's rampant. And, and really, if insurance companies wanted to, they could cut the churn down. They could put lead companies out of business if they simply just stopped and said, wow, we have all this data. We have all these prior customers, all these current customers. Let's treat them better. But instead, instead, I'm like, I'm, I guess we'll call it my final point before we slide all the way down this bad slope. <laughs> Are you trying to subsidize, subsidize pro sports? Is that what's going on here? Because surely you know your customer. You know who you want as a customer far better than just putting an advertisement up during a football match or, or running it during a commercial we're, we're trying to watch the show to be entertained. I don't need an insurance commercial to entertain me. I don't need a, a fabulous regional in New York based insurance company spending money on billboards. I need them to go pay claims or pay me more money because I'm your distributor. Don't put up another billboard. Nobody needs your billboard. Who would choose a billboard over a tree? Who would rather see a, a nice fall leaves changing tree well, no, nah, I'm going to look at a billboard that teaches more insurance. It's just not happening. We just need to do better. 
someone said uh, it might even have been you who was saying on on twitter recently they were talking about youtube ads and they were oh. saying that when i'm trying to watch a video and your stupid advert interrupts my your inane advert they're all awful as well interrupts the thing i'm trying to watch on youtube i don't feel like i want to buy from you i feel like i hate you and i would do absolutely anything not to buy from you it isn't a positive experience oh. It's brutal. I think, Nick, maybe you and I have said this. I pay for YouTube premium mm. just to avoid the advertising because it was so bad. It's just uh, but too, many so much money. Uh. too many geckos, too many geckos. But I, I, w- I would say, Billy, um, the if it wasn't for insurance advertising, we wouldn't have flow or the gecko or mayhem like. They're, they're, they're an institution. I think it's American, a, fo- American football is really I, bad as well, right? Because oh, whenever no. I've seen it, American football is like every the time the ball goes out of play, you seem to have an advert for five <laughs> yes. minutes. Yes. It's, it's insane. That's part of why I follow your football is because you get that little mini ad up at the top of the screen near the scoreboard is what is all we see. And mm. then you play for 45 to 50 minutes. And I'm not interrupted. And I know mm. when the match is going to start. And I know when the match is going to end. You do a little bit of advertising in the middle there. And then it's over. It's mm. tremendous. It's such a better way to go about things. So many better ways to spend money. Think about the failed logic or the archaic logic there. I'm going to put my name on a building. Hope someone comes. Sees the sign. Thinks about insurance finds an agent who has that product, has multiple quotes, and that this one gets it so that they can buy it so they can afford to go to the stadium and see the sign again. I mean, if there's, if there's a less ineffective, efficient way to drive marketing and dollars towards a sale, that would be it. So what about, what about taking those same dollars and driving them through agents or brokers, targeted, data-driven, targeted towards clients who would favor that product or that service, specifically on behalf of that carrier, presenting the value of their coverage, their service, their enhancements, and then placing it. And then when their house doesn't burn down, they can go to the game and see the sign again. And so it's just backwards. Pretty much everything you don't like in insurance, just do the opposite. And you'll be, you'll, you'll be right where you need to be. It's just backward. And it was built on the assumptions that insurance agents and brokers weren't marketers. And there was a time when we weren't. But but I but but we market here. We have a we have a marketer inside our agency, and we spend the dollars and deploy dollars through a chosen broker or agent to a targeted customer around a value prop that favors the carrier is absolutely for the win. That's how it should be done. Just reverse it. The, the George Costanza method. I love uh, it. Costanza. Yeah. Just do the opposite. Ed, Ed doesn't know what we're talking about. I have absolutely no idea. I'm just sitting here smiling politely, um, <laughs> being very British. Just being <laughs> polite. If there was a queue, I'd go and stand in it. <laughs> we haven't talked about the weather. I'm lost. That, that's all we talk about in, in, in Britain. But <laughs> that, it looks lovely behind you there, Nick. It looks like you've really picked a nice day for it. But uh, I'm going to pass over now. I'm going to do, do this really corny thing. I'm going to turn to the side. As if I'm as if I'm actually talking off shot to uh, Rob, who's very quietly been sat uh, judging you mercilessly on your persuasiveness, yes, yes. Uh, deciding who is the uh, who is the most convincing person on grinding my gears. So we've had uh, Nick Lamparelli has offered up uh, governance as his uh, insurance governance. Uh, Seth has offered the the sentence or the the principle of people saying that agents can't or agents shouldn't, agents can't, shouldn't, won't. Well, um, and, and Billy Van Dura has offered insurance advertising. So, Rob, it is over to you to summarize and decide who you think has been most persuasive and which of these should be cast into the depths of hell forever. Yeah, and we've got uh, three terrific candidates here. So uh, this is, uh, yeah, a bit, of a, a bit of a death match here. I'm definitely sympathetic to uh, Nick's uh, insurance regulation. Uh, I, I've always wondered, you know, we have... Uh, 700 insurance companies in my home state of Texas alone. Uh, this is not a monopolistic market by any means. There's lots and lots of choices out there. Um, so I've, I've often wondered about insurance regulation. I think I've got some stats in my book, uh, The End of Insurance, as we know it, talking about the cost of regulation versus the uh, 
the benefits uh, of regulatory action. So definitely sympathetic to that one. Also sympathetic to uh, Seth's argument, uh, wrote an article in Last Agent Standing talking about the, the revenge of independent agents and um, absolutely right. You know, yes, there's some that are out there that are um, kind of, you know, waiting until the days until they can kind of retire, but most of them are, are highly engaged. Uh, we've got um, just a, a ton of terrific uh, younger agents out there and even older agents that are doing a tremendous job adapting to technology and uh, very much close to the customers. But I, I have to give it to Billy this week, um, A, because it personally is one of the things that grinds my gears. This is immense waste of money. I'm sick of the Geico ween. This shouldn't be a phrase even uh, that we're now seeing here in the States. <laughs> You know, they spent over a billion dollars of advertising. Now everybody's kind of jumped in after them. So it's billions and billions just waste. And we shouldn't know these characters. You know, 95% of American children know these names, Geico, State Farm, et cetera. It's just really uh, disgusting. And then hearing the commentary from Seth, from Nick, I think they secretly agree with Billy. So uh, we're going <laughs> to champion Billy as our winner. And insurance advertising should be cast into the gates of hell congratulations billy i'm not quite sure how i'm going to animate this or what we're going to do on the next part so we're going to leave this week there could be anything going on on screen right now or nothing i'm not sure but once the edit goes in you'll see but that brings us to the end of the show well done billy van Jura. you are today's winner and our most persuasive guest thank you so much to nick seth and billy for their suggestions and just a really great chat lots of fun let's make insurance fun again and thank you rob for your exceptional co-hosting and thanks to you at home for watching. We will see you on the next one. Thanks a lot.